Somebody recently said to me, Hey Salty, would you explain the water analogy for electricity? And I said, sure, no problem, but let me make it a video, because I think this is a thing that goes a lot better with pictures. And also, if it's a video, people can rewatch it as many times as they want. So the water analogy tries to give you an intuitive feel for the way that electricity flows in an electrical circuit by comparing that flow of electricity to the flow of water in pipes. Clearly, this analogy is not going to be perfect because not everything will have an analog and water isn't actually electricity. But for a beginner just starting out who's trying to grapple with a way to think about electrical circuits, this really isn't a bad way. And although it does have its limits and you will have to abandon it eventually, if you're just looking to get started, this is actually a pretty good way to go. My explanation of the analogy isn't going to include a lot of mathematics. So if you're looking for an explanation of how to work V equals IR, or why watts are equal to I times V, this isn't the video for you. You probably want to find another video or any of many web pages out there on the internet that will explain that to you. So this diagram right here kind of gives you a basic idea of what's going on. In the hydraulic or water circuit, you have a pump which produces pressure, and it pushes water around this loop of pipe and just keeps recirculating the same water over and over again. We'll have a cheat sheet over here so you can get an idea for what some of the analogs are between plumbing and circuits. But let's just start with electricity or the water in the pipes itself. So electrons are very small and they're very light, and so in that way they're kind of like individual molecules of water. You can keep dividing a little piece of water smaller and smaller until you know, human eyes can no longer see how small it is, and you could keep dividing it farther than that. Kind of the same thing with electricity. It's fungible. You can divide it up very, very small. Another thing to talk about is maybe the pipes themselves. In this analogy, pipes have a very interesting property. If you were to break a pipe open in a plumbing system, water would just spew out. But an actual wire that carries electrical current, when you break that wire, it instantly self-caps, and none of the electricity comes out. So as you're understanding this analogy, understand that a broken pipe instantaneously self-caps and there is no leakage like there would be in a plumbing or hydraulic system. Another thing about wires is that they're always full of electricity. There are free electrons or nearly free electrons in the wire at all times. It's only a matter of exerting some pressure to make them move down the wire. So in that way, it's kind of like any pipes that you build a plumbing system out of. Not only do they self-cap, but they're always full of water. You hook up a new length of pipe, it doesn't need to be filled, it's already full of water. Now there's two real quantities, well three really, that we work with when we work with electricity. There are volts, and in the hydraulic analogy, volts are essentially analogous to water pressure. So think PSI. You know, a 9-volt battery, maybe that's equivalent to a 9 pounds per square inch pump that is able to maintain 9 pounds per square inch of pressure even as it is pumping a large number, a large current of water. Likewise, this is a good time to talk about amps. We talk about gallons per minute, the number of gallons per minute of water that could go through a certain size pipe. In electricity, we talk about amps. Amps is just the number of electrons per second that can go through a wire. So hopefully that gives you already some kind of intuitive feel for how the water analogy works. Pumps create pressure, they cause a flow of water, and that water goes through pipes and perhaps there's friction or valves that sort of turn on and off the flow or resist the flow. Likewise, in an electrical circuit, we have a battery that pumps electrical current through the wires, and perhaps there's some resistance or some switches that either turn on and off the flow of electricity or resist the flow of electricity going through them. And resistance is something that I think it's kind of hard for the water analogy to account for well. I've seen two different ways that you can talk about resistance in the hydraulic analogy. One is to simply say that resistance is a really skinny pipe. So imagine trying to pump 100 gallons per second through a pipe that's only a millimeter wide. Obviously, you would need a tremendous amount of pressure to pull that off. That's an okay way to make an analogy for a resistor, but I actually like a different analogy better. So imagine you have a pump, and it's pumping water through this loop, and there's a sand filter in the actual pipe. Now if your filter is coarser, like let's say the filter was made of three-quarter inch rocks, 
the water doesn't have a very hard time getting in between the rocks and getting through that filter. As a result, the pump doesn't have to pump very hard to get a large get number of gallons per minute going through the loop. Now imagine a sand filter where the grains of sand are very, very fine. Fine sand or even silt. Can you imagine how hard this pump is going to have to work and how high the pressure is going to have to be in this part of the pipe coming into the filter in order to pump a significant number of gallons per minute through this loop? So this is what I think is the better way to think about resistors in the water analogy. They're like pipes, but they have obstructions in them. Could be large obstructions that the water can easily go around, could be very tiny little densely packed obstructions that make it very difficult for the water to get through. So when you think about resistance, think about how hard it is to push electricity through them and how much voltage or how much PSI in the water model it would take to push, I don't know, one gallon per second through there. Is it a lot of volts to push one amp through? Or is it not very many volts to push one amp through because it's not very hard to push water through your sand filter. With those basics out of the way, I think we can move on to some more complicated components. I guess we should probably talk about capacitors and inductors. Try to imagine a capacitor as a chamber with a flexible diaphragm in it. So as you can see, there isn't any real steady flow of water through here. The capacitor also, when you pump water into it, this diaphragm stretches out. Because it's springy, it wants to actually spring back. So let's say the pump runs for a while, it pumps water in here, and this diaphragm gets pushed so far that it's all the way on the far side of the chamber. Then suppose the pump shuts off, and suppose there's no check valve to keep the water from flowing back. The springiness of that diaphragm is going to want to push water backwards through the pipe, back through the pump, until it manages to sort of go back to flat and no longer has any spring pressure pushing it either way. So this is the best way to think about a capacitor in the water analogy. Hopefully that gives you some basis for thinking about capacitors in your electronic circuits. They take some electricity to sort of get them into tension, and then when they have a chance, they sort of spring back to wherever their resting point is, and they have to push some water out as they spring back. Another obvious component we should probably talk about is inductors. Now, I like to think about inductors as a turbine that sits in the pipe. Let's imagine that your pump kicks up and water starts to flow past this little turbine. As the water flows past, it's going to start the turbine spinning. But you're going to pay a price for starting up the turbine and making it spin, which is it's going to take more pressure on the input side in order to spin that turbine up, and you're going to have less pressure on the output side. Now consider what happens if the pump stops pumping. The turbine is still spinning, and its own inertia is going to keep it spinning, and it's going to try and push water through the pipe even though there isn't any pressure on this side, on the input, trying to make that water flow. So as this turbine is spinning down, it's going to try and continue pushing water through the pipe, even though there isn't any incoming pressure on the input side. So those are the three basic circuit elements. You have resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Now let's talk about some slightly more advanced analogies, particularly semiconductors. Most semiconductors are based on the idea of a diode, uh, a PN junction. And let's talk about what that would kind of look like in the water analogy. Consider this little thing, a little spring-loaded trapdoor in the pipe. When there's a little bit of pressure on the input, that little bit of pressure pushes this door open, causing the spring to expand, and water can flow through. Then if the pressure declines below the point where it's not enough pressure to actually stretch the spring out, the spring will cause the door to come back to the closed position. So it takes pressure, remember, pressure is voltage, takes voltage, to open up and make flow happen. Now if there's no pressure, then the spring will close the door, and the door will stay closed, and it won't matter how much reverse pressure you put through here, or at least it's going to take unbelievable levels of reverse pressure to break that door and cause the flow of water to reverse through here. 
And it's not really important how the semiconductor physics works here. I just want you to understand it's a one-way valve that requires a little bit of pressure to stretch out that spring and get that door to open. If you don't have enough pressure, it's not going to open. You're not going to get flow. And if you try and reverse the flow, that door is going to stop the reverse flow from happening. Another component that is very commonly used in circuits that you probably want to have an analogy for is transistors. Now, this is what's called a base junction transistor, aka NPN or PNP transistor. The model that I like the most for this is that you basically have a small one-way valve, and then you have a big one-way valve, and the small valve, by means of this rope and the pulley, controls the big valve. So if you put a little bit of water through the small valve, that water will go down here and go through the output, but because it's opening up the big valve, a lot more water can flow through the big valve. And that's a pretty good analogy for what a bipolar transistor is. You can maybe also imagine a MOSFET transistor. What if we put a capacitor, a little flexible diaphragm right here, and the flexible diaphragm, the pressure on the flexible diaphragm were to push this lever open? There wouldn't be any water flow through here because that flexible diaphragm is preventing it from happening. However, the flexible diaphragm is still pushing open the little door, and therefore the big one-way valve is also coming open, and a lot of water can flow through the main part of the transistor. That's a pretty good analogy for what a MOSFET transistor is. It has a capacitor in the control part that prevents any kind of steady flow from happening. If this model of a transistor is too much for you, then it might be easier to think of as the alternate model, where you have a small amount of water that sort of opens up this little valve right here, which then allows a very large amount of water to come through the main body of the valve. Whichever of these two you like better is fine by me. And really, you can think of this in the same way. What if the little capacitor diaphragm was right here? Then you would have pressure coming in here, pushing up the valve, but because the diaphragm prevented any kind of real flow from happening, you wouldn't actually get flow coming out. All right, that's about it for the water analogy. There's lots and lots of videos on YouTube about the water analogy. There's lots and lots of web pages. My personal favorite is this one from University of Waterloo, and I will actually drop the link to that in the description so you can see it. I hope this helps you learn more and have an intuitive mental model about electricity, and I hope you're having a good one. Somebody once told me the Saudis killed Khashoggi. They cut him up before he was dead. No, no, wait, that's not right. That's not this video. Different video, sorry.